Oh, I'm about to start. Um, don't forget, we have some free cards and bookmarks um, and pens and pencils down the end, so feel free to take some. This is our second last one. We have Brian, who we have in the audience today. He's his is on tomorrow, so if you can come tomorrow to see to listen to Brian's talk, that'd be wonderful. Um, I'd just like to welcome to today's talk our boots and cloth scraps, a surprise find of early colonial garments and footwear at Angle Sea Barracks with Dr. Jennifer Jones Travis. Today's talk is of a topic about a tradesman found a selection of leather shoes and textile pieces beneath the officer's mess at Anglesey Barracks. A building constructed in 1827 as the new range soldier barracks, the second construction on the site. Assessment of these artefacts identified that they dated to the early colonial period and represented a range of rare objects reflecting early conflict, military and civilian footwear and garments. Today's talk is being broadcast as a webinar and we are pleased to welcome those people who are joining us online today. In due course, the talk will be available on Libraries Tasmanian SoundCloud and on Libraries Tasmanian YouTube channel. And Clifford has already uploaded. How many have you uploaded now? Uh, the first couple of weeks. The first couple of weeks. So if you go on, you've missed the first couple of weeks. They're already there on our, um, on our Libraries Tasmanian website. If you haven't already done so, please switch your phones off now. Um, Jennifer, you want to take, talk, uh, take questions at the end of the talk? Um, yes, yeah. sounds good. Or, sure. And before I int introduce Jennifer, I'd like to read to you Library of Tasmania's Acknowledgement of Tasmania's Aboriginal Peoples. Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and culture of the Aboriginal people of Lichuata, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmania Aboriginal people as the traditional and continual custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, tradition, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Awesome. Thanks, Sandra. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I love that this is a hybrid format, so it's slightly less terrifying having like a normal number of people um, in person. So um, thank you so much for that and for the introduction. Um, and just, yeah, to kind of follow up on the um, acknowledgement of country, just noting that we are on the lands of the Muanina people, um, you know, and do acknowledge their, um, the con oh, I'm so sorry, acknowledging the connection of Tasmanian Aboriginal people um, and uh, acknowledging their elders past and present. I'm so sorry, I'm a little bit nervous and I'm very jet lagged because I only got in from Canada a couple of days ago. So um, please forgive me my verbal stumbling. Um, and I will hope that I can figure out how to um, work at this. So I think to get started, the first thing we'll introduce is the idea of costume and dress in the colonies and kind of the role that that plays. Um, so, you know, in, in the early colonial era and arguably everywhere, including in penal colonies, um, clothing was used to classify and identify convicts, military personnel and free settlers. So more than that, clothing cut and color, um, as well as probably quality, um, was meant to enable differentiation further within these groups. Um, so, for example, you know, it gives you a ready identification of a convict's class, of a soldier's rank, um, and a free settler's occupation, right? Like we, this is a general statement for archaeology and um, material culture studies, we say a lot with our clothing, and a lot of us have a really quick think about people that you've seen on the street and thought about what they're wearing and what that says about them. There are a lot of signals that are tied into that, and so a lot of what we actually say about ourselves comes from our clothing. Um, and what, if you're, if you're forced to wear certain types of clothing, um, that only gets more complicated. Um, so during the transportation period, the British government was responsible for supplying dress to most of Australia's inhabitants, um, including convicts, civil and military officials, some settlers and many Aboriginal people. And so in, in Tasmania, you know, for example, that would include those captured and forcibly incarcerated uh, places like Waibalina and Putalina, Oyster Cove. Um, so the supply of clothing to Australia was haphazard um, and shortages and inadequacies 
inadequacies plagued the settlements, making it really difficult to actually regulate appearance in accordance with these classifications. So Hobart in particular is noted as having a particularly irregular issue of clothing. So clothing and footwear were subject to uh, extremely harsh living conditions, resulting in considerable wear and tear. And this would have affected the appearance and well-being of transportees and military personnel, offering little protection from sun or rain during hard labor. Can you imagine walking through the bush here with no clothes or no shoes? Oh my goodness. Sorry, these, I have my very formal notes. These are my sides. Oh my goodness, what a nightmare. Um, so convicts, especially, they suffered the most from inadequate clothing, um, even to a point where there was a threat of rebellion. And I have a feeling this might be captured on one of these walls somewhere. Um, so it was so concerning that in 1820, Governor Macquarie wrote and warned the secretary for the colonies that if garments didn't arrive soon, there may be alarming consequences. Like he was afraid of an uprising um, because there wasn't enough clothing to go around and people were really upset and really angry. Um, so if you have a look at this image here, um, so this is from 1832. And so the convicts are clothed. This is an improvement, um, but note that it's about 44 years after the colony in New South Wales was established. Um, and in, in this image, at least two of them are missing shoes. So we've got this friend here who's shoveling, right? He's using a spade to dig into the ground. And this, uh, this fellow, there's a couple of missing shoes throughout here um, and missing bits and pieces of garlic garments. I'm not sure if he's naked or just has a very yellow color shirt on. Um, but, you know, like they're cutting stones for retaining walls in the Blue Mountains at Mitchell's Pass. Like, again, can you imagine doing that barefoot? I'm not sure if anyone else has been to the Blue Mountains, very akin to this, very rocky, very pebbly. You've got no shoes and you're doing hard labor. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. Anyways. So regardless of, you know, all of these systems of, of dress and, um, you know, planned differentiations in society based on clothing colors, um, it never was actually sufficiently enforced in the penal colonies, especially for convicts, though these systems were carefully designed and described. So in the early years of the colonies, convicts and free working class settlers were issued with government clothing. So basic loose garments described as slops um, based on a Dutch word for a seaman's wide breeches. So these were effectively drab working class clothing that everybody kind of wandered around in. Similar clothing was issued to military personnel not on active duty. So if you think of it, garments were hard enough to find then, right? You know, early, early colonial era, they're hard enough to find then. Um, and now even fewer have actually survived into museum collections and archeological assemblages. So there's very little tangible evidence of this sort of this phase of history um, in Australia. So the clothing of upper and, you know, middle-class people is pretty well documented in portraits and other artworks, as well as museum collections, right? Like wealthy families, you know, they keep the christening gowns and those are passed down, you know, through the centuries and the decades. And then, you know, they go to sort of like a local museum or a state, a state museum, you know, not, you know, the, the uniform of everyday laborers, convicts and servants and soldiers, like the, these things don't usually survive. You know, you get the really fancy things that the wealthy people had, not, not the day-to-day -day stuff. There's very, very few of those. And so the whole kind of premise of this talk uh, in one part um, is that a collection of these types of artifacts from under the second soldier barracks at Anglesey Barracks in Hobart, um, you know, gives us a bit of insight into this material, this class of material culture, um, as well as the evidence of considerable resource shortage behind it. Oh, okay. So we'll begin with this lovely panoramic image of Hobarton in 1833. Um, so we've got a lovely sweeping view of the settlement to the west towards Kanani, Mount Wellington, from the River Derwent. Um, so going back about 20 years before this lovely image was painted, um, <laughs> when Governor Lachlan McCoy arrived in 1811 to inspect the settlement in Van Diemen's Land, he basically described the soldiers as, just to paraphrase, um, drunken gambling womanizers would be the general gist of it if we wanted to go there. Um, so he moved them from... Uh, their accommodation in the center of what was probably a lively, you know, marine merchant town here, Blue Arrow, here, you know, they're sort of uh, located within the town, um, and made a proclamation that a new barracks be constructed at the top of this hill over that end, um, ensuring that the soldiers were not influenced by unruly convicts or others of ill repute. So I just, I love the really kind of physical presentation of that distance, like, here's the town, it's like, sorry, sorry, guys, you're you're going over here. Um, you keep drinking too much and, you know, mingling with the convicts and uh, people of ill repute. So um, there you go. 
And so here's a print showing the Anglesey Barracks, established at the top of what is now Barrack Hill on Davy Street. And so the first building there being formally finished in 1815. Um, so the second soldier barracks, the source of the artifact collection we'll be discussing today, is marked with a red arrow, so visible there overlooking the parade ground. So this plan shows the approximate location and layout of the buildings. It was designed in 1828 with the location from which the artifacts were recovered marked with a red arrow. So we had to go into this space. So what you can not see from this beautiful image is the fact that we got to go under the floor. I don't know if it's a got to or had to. We'll decide how we phrase that. Um, so this is how we got into the site. Um, so the project all started with an unexpected find under what eventually became the officer's mess. So a tradesman brought the Department of Defense's Environment and Sustainability Manager, Dr. Kate Hibbert, a pair of leather boots from under the building and sort of asked like, oh, you know, might, might these be important? So I was called in afterwards and looking at the artifact assemblage determined it to be highly significant for its historical and research values, as well as its rarity, which we'll get into in a moment. So the site was at risk. So I don't know if you can see that, that lovely PVC pipe, that's sewage. Ooh, yes, risk. Um, and so the thing is, they in the 1970s, they punched through this sort of standing wall of the building. They punched through sewer, electrical, um, and water services, basically, to kind of upgrade the building, to add in toilets and, you know, other facilities, kitchen facilities, things like that. Um, the only thing is, you know, trades need to maintain these things. So going in under the floor every time they go through, you know, they're potentially grinding and dragging artifacts um, over a pile of bricks that existed under there. Um, never mind the risk, like heaven forbid, you know, don't forget this is this is mostly cloth, like textile and, and leather. Um, if one of those pipes burst and the site then was covered with sewage or water or things like that. Um, so we developed a plan to remove the surface artifacts that were kind of at risk of trampling as well as immediate inflow of, of liquid. Um, and then we covered the site with breathable geofabric and sand to protect the underlying deposits. So through our lovely access point, um, we removed nearly 2,000 artifacts from the surface of the space under that one sort of room um, and bucketed in three tons of sand by hand. Three tons, yeah, I'm like, I'm like okay, three tons, it was crazy. We had to wheelbarrow it and shovel it all into buckets and like slide it in this giant room. Um, yeah, so just stabilize and protect the site. Sorry, I'm I'm horrified by that number. So um, I always love to share it. And so here's um, an image of the protection works underway. So that's the team underneath. So we've collected the artifacts. Um, we've laid the geofabric, and we are basically sliding buckets on the um, along the uh, bits of plywood, which we then left along the main access route. So that way, trades, you know, have an easy way to access without trampling anything underneath. So um, yes, it was entirely as glamorous as it looked. So preliminary findings. So there are a lot of artifacts and a lot of things, I guess, ways that you can look at this assemblage. So I'm just going in a very basic overview today. Um, so to start with, surprise, we found military uniforms. We found a lot of military uh, uniform remnants. And so here's kind of like a piece of, you know, kind of the quintessential red coat, as you'd imagine it. One really interesting thing we found is that you can see it's actually lined on the chest with like a cotton batting. And so, you know, questions as to whether the lining served um, because it's cold, you know, it's, it's not too warm in Hobart or if it's something to do with like, you know, in, in battle, like is it a bit of protection, you know, on your chest space. So, you know, that was really interesting. There's not, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, quite early examples laying around. Um, we've got some yellow epaulets from various military jackets. Um, the yellow trim suggests they are from possibly, and I'm like, Chris is here, you can and I'm sure anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've looked this up. The 12th, 17th, or 80th regiments, um, or possibly the New South Wales Corps. So there's a number of different um, military regiments that basically, you know, use different colors of trim to delineate on um, which regiment they were part of as part of the uniform markings. Um, there are some trousers with like red piping. Um, and here's a really interesting bit of like, it's either a suspender or with the two pieces there for trousers or possibly something for strapping up supplies, um, you know, as they kind of carried things around on their um, various duties. So here are examples um, of what is termed convict striped shirt fabric in the literature. So the Imperial government imported thousands of yards of this blue striped fabric to clothe its population. And instead of being used specifically for convicts, um, though that's what the kind of the terminology refers to, 
Um, there's a really good chance that this comprised part of the slop's clothing distributed across the population receiving rations, including clothing from the government. So here we've got a shirt collar and a shirt cuff um, made from the same fabric, as well as, you know, the body of a larger garment. Um, so there's variations in the thickness and gauge of the striping, and that's evident across all of the pieces. Um, and the same is found across similar clothing recovered um, from Hyde Park's Bay in Sydney, which is actually a really interesting, um, you know, really interesting cross-reference. So this is um, an 1840s convict shirt from Hyde Park Barracks, so recovered from within, it's either under the floor or within one of the walls. It was recovered, sort of stashed within one of the buildings, um, and it's one of the very few examples that actually exists. So, you know, there is something to compare to. Hooray! Um, so it does show some really good consistencies with the garment pieces that we had from Hyde Park Barracks. Um, so one major difference, though, is that, you know, where the convict clothing exists, it was usually marked with, you know, it had a mark for a broad arrow or an institution or other government markings on it to delineate where it came from and who that person sort of belonged to. We haven't had any marks like that yet, which kind of supports the idea that this might be, you know, more to do with the military establishment um, as opposed to, to convicts specifically. Um, and so I've learned recently from some very knowledgeable colleagues um, that convict clothing in Hobart was generally distributed via the Bond store near the waterfront, so now part of TMAG. Um, and so the pieces that we have are like were likely distributed to soldiers and their families through the quartermaster store at the barracks. So it probably came through a slightly different route than you know, materials coming in for the convicts. Um, the consistency in material and style to convict clothing is, however, interesting in itself and speaks to the difficulties in visually differentiating the citizenry by the cut and color of their clothing. And so you can see some of the consistencies in you know, the various finishes um, you know, with the shirt from Hyde Park Barracks. I'd love to actually physically go and do an assessment in person to actually see how they compare. But at this stage, you know, we're kind of in the preliminary, oh, how interesting phase of investigations. Um, so this, this one piece was actually had has the most amazing story. So this is a shirt collar. Um, and you can see just very faintly there, it says T Lan, Lan Ne, and there, it's repeated over here, and it says 63rd Regiment G. Um, so with some help from Professor Hamish Maxwell Stewart, um, as well as Dr. Kate Hibbert, um, we've actually managed to piece together where this, this collar came from, which is so amazing. Um, so Private Thomas Lannan, slash Lennon, um, was a laborer, tailor, and soldier from County Mayo in Ireland. So he enlisted in the British military in 1821, and he formed part of the 63rd Regiment where he was a grenadier, um, and he was part of the, I can't remember the name of the flank, but it's basically like the tallest, strongest soldier. So the first, I think the first flank. So, you know, very fancy, very um, lovely. So he was stationed in Avoca in Van Diemen's Land from June 1832. So a couple of months after he kind of first made it to BDL, um, he was drinking at the Gray's Arms public house with some colleagues. And so he was found lying on the floor, having overconsumed by two of his colleagues with a couple of constables. So they're basically just like laying on the floor of the pub between nine to 11 o'clock at night. Um, and basically his colleagues kind of said like, hey, you know, friend, it's it's almost 11 o'clock. We've got to get back to the barracks, you know, um, let's let's all wake up. And he effectively said that if anyone, they, when they tried to wake him up, they said, look, if you get too close to me, I will, here's the quote, stick the first of them that came nigh, is his um, description of it. And sure enough, that's how he killed his colleague, um, Private McCabe. Yeah, so basically um, he came to like wake him up and get off the floor and he stabbed him with a pocket knife. So um, yeah, so realizing his error though, like it's actually, it's a very sad story because basically he did it while he was drunk and it, it happened, you know, his friends, there's some lovely um, 19th century descriptions like, and then he, he said, oh, I have been stabbed. And then, you know, died promptly after. Um, but, you know, he feels awful, right? Like we've all, maybe all, haven't all, but like, you know, we've all misjudged, not lied on the floor and stabbed a friend, you know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you know, we've all made mis misjudgments and, you know, regretted it immediately afterwards. And, you know, basically he's done it. And then he said to his his colleagues, he's like, shoot me, like, shoot me now. I, I would like you to kill me on the spot. You know, I, I can't believe I've done this. He feels so awful. Um, and because he was given an excellent character witness, um, as well as, uh, you know, there's no existing malice. Like, they're actually kind of friends, which almost, almost makes it worse, right? Like, you kind of accidentally killed your friend. That's a bit awful. Um, you know, they've, they've basically decided not to sentence him um, to death for murder. They've then, you know, found him guilty of manslaughter. And so he was then sentenced for life to Hobart. 
hilarious. You know, send this to Hobart. He actually got sent to Norfolk Island um, at the time, but he was he was sentenced to life in Hobart. Um, and then he ended up in Norfolk Island. We don't know much more about what happened to him, but this jacket collar, we think, um, or at least the pieces of it, um, as part of the um, dishonorable discharge process, they actually would very publicly tear the collars off of the soldier in public, um, probably in like the parade square or something. So, you know, it's interesting to think how this one piece has actually ended up eventually in the collection. Um, and there's a very a very sad and kind of very harrowing story about that. So, yeah, that was um, Thomas Lennon, the one person we've been able to track um, so far in this project. Um, so outside of the men's military uniforms, um, we have evidence of women and children too. So ordinary soldiers had to be given permission to marry, um, and the colonel of the regiment might give 12 soldiers in a company, so of 100 men, permission to marry at the terms on the regiment. And so that meant that the wives and children would be provided rations at no extra cost. So they're suddenly, you know, women and children are suddenly bundled in the scheme of, uh, you know, government clothing and bits and pieces going out. Um, and so being married on the regiment, the soldiers' wives were expected to do the washing and the sewing for the soldiers as a way of offsetting their, the cost of their rations. Um, and so like to kind of give like a rough estimate of like proportions, in October 1816, the military establishment at Hobart had 66 men, but it also had six women and 16 children. So, you know, there's actually, you know, a few different age groups um, and genders of people getting around the place. Um, and so, you know, we've got evidence of these women and children in some of the artifacts that we come through. And so this this has been kind of fished from a female convict research seminar, so I really had to try to pull here. So there's some red petite clothing, petite clothing, um, probably from India, which is really interesting, like representing that kind of connection between um, regents being raised in India and, you know, coming through to Tasmania. It's actually quite a common process. So that is very cool. Not 100% sure it's women, but that is a woman's boot. So, you know, yeah, yeah there's a, a woman who's upon the record somewhere. Um, and so other things that we have, we have some children's clothing, which is really fascinated, fascinating, um, because like, especially working class children, so little remains of them, you know, in, in the records, um, the archaeological records, especially. So we've got um, a small child's shoe with this like cloth backing. So that would be about a size. It fit a child about three to four by today's standards. So a kid of like 10 back in the day. Hey -oh. No, sorry, um, that's just a bad joke. Kids are so massive these days. Um, and then what we've got here is actually really fascinating. So this is, again, that convict striped shirt fabric, right? So that's the commonly imported, like widely adopted um, type of fabric, kind of issued for generic clothing. But it's a baby gown. Like, what? Like, nothing like this exists anywhere. It's a child's gown. Um, you know, and when you're reading about the clothing of children from that period, it's actually like working class children's clothing is so rare that most of the authors I've read postulate they were just dressed in adult slops. They just tied really tight, you know. And this is this is a purpose made child's gown. It's got like little ruched sleeves. It's got a drawstring and it's kind of it's slightly open. So whether it was for a special occasion or something, um, you know, I don't exactly know, but it's 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 amazing and there's really nothing else like it. So, um, wow, so cool. <laughs> Um, very different. And there's just, yeah, there's no baseline to compare this to yet. Um, so other bits of clothing that we find, they're they're not obviously easy to assign um, by free status or gender. Um, so there's some pieces here of white cotton shirt um, with bone and mother of pearl buttons, um, but they both provide evidence of repeated mending. And so the shirt on the right, having been entirely cut across, like this shirt has actually been totally just like cut through and then reattached. So we have this evidence of like mending and alteration for the clothing, which is not, you know, not necessarily unusual. Um, this is a wool sock um, and stocking piece sort of recovered from Anglesey Barracks. So this one actually provided a really beautiful example of hand mending. So you can actually see where it's been darned there. So they cross hatch pattern over the kind of um, the knit, the knit. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's torn through impressively in, in several other places. Um, and it has evidence of possibly blood stains. So one thing I'm going to do is actually a game called, hey, is this blood? And um, take it to some forensic people. So I um, have some friends who do a lot of work um, in the forensic space. So I am very curious to see where blood is actually appearing on this clothing. Um, so this brings, you know, everything to kind of one of the, the big thrusts of this paper. So obviously there's not a lot of early clothing from the working class. We have some, oh my gosh, that's so cool. The other one is evidence of resource shortage um, in, in Hobart. So we read, we read about resource shortages um, and the lack of things like food and clothing. So a find like the one at Anglesey Barracks, I think makes it tangible and perhaps frames it in a way um, that can be difficult to 
grasp in text alone. So for example, like this piece of brown wool fabric um, was patched with a piece of black wool fabric, which itself was actually made from two separate pieces of fabric sewn together. And then all of it was like restitched into this main brown piece using like oakum, either oakum or bits of like rope fiber or jute or something like that. Um, and this was eventually, you know, cut into a larger rectangular patch when the garment itself was no longer usable, potentially for reuse somewhere else. Um, and so I think that a lot of the evidence that we've recovered from the site provides evidence of resource shortages and an institution scrambling to get like any form of clothing it can onto its wards. So, you know, so what is missing from these relatively glossy, I know so glamorous, are very glamorous archaeological photos, um, is there, there are hundreds, hundreds of pieces of scraps um, of both textiles and leathers. Um, and, you know, they're, they're found alongside pieces of clothing mended multiple times, you know, unstitched and ready for use in other garments. Like that's one of the interesting things is they're actually like taking clothing apart, like at the seams for reuse in other places, which is you know really fascinating. I think really innovative and probably very desperate, you know, all of those things nicely bundled all together. Um, and, you know, we get similar pieces from different garments brought together, you know, to create a new garment, like a new soldier's jacket or new trousers. Um, and then you get shoes, shoes like this, wow, the shoe collection is fascinating. You get, you know, shoes and boots with the soles mended at least four times. And then once they've been mended four times and they're no longer useful, like it's, I'm, I mean, I realize a lot of people who've grown up in other areas might realize this is just normal, but I was fascinated by the resourcefulness, you know, because you then shear the entire upper up off and then that's used to then make new patches, which is really, you know, really lovely. Um, and so all in all, like, I think the artifacts that we found give evidence of a cobbler um, and possibly a seamstress or tailor, like working in a quartermaster store to actually like create these new garments. So you might just be getting, you know, torn half finished garments coming in on a ship. And then they're basically just like making whatever they can and then redistributing that out to the military and their families. Like that's what I think we're looking at. Um, there's a whole other theory I won't get into because I don't have enough time, but I think in summary, I think that workshop exists under that building. I think it got knocked over um, to then build, you know, the second officer's mess or the second soldier barracks. Um, so, yeah. Um, so the one, I guess the one thought I can't shake is this. Okay, so we would say that, you know, I've, I've had someone say to me, and I took this on board, so it was a really good point. You know, wouldn't you see this in a 1930s farm in Tasmania? You know, is this really evidence of resource shortage? But my response to that would be, yes, absolutely. But would you not say depression evidence, you know, depression era Tasmania is evidence of resource shortage? I think the crux of this, like the, the most interesting thing in all of this is that looking at the clothing pieces that they've got, and I've not shown you all, all the examples of half, half mangled, half finished piece, bits and pieces, is that these are the people meant to be instilling control in your colonial population. They are meant through their through their impressive dress and their very clear differentiation with the convicts. They are controlling your citizens. They are controlling your convicts. They are going around in rags. They're going around in rags of bits and pieces of clothing stitched together five or six times. And I think that's maybe the point. You know, if this was another rural site, you know, or a farm, you'd say, oh, wow, they had a really rough year. They're recycling everything. And they should. They're making you put whatever they have. But this is a point that your soldiers are going out you know, their their shoes are like literally falling off of them. They're patched to the point that they can't be worn. Like there's blood, their, so their socks seem to be soaked with blood. You know, like it, it's something totally different. And that's that's maybe the point is that these are the people who are meant to be in control. You know, this this is where they're at. Like how are they effectively instilling control if you can't tell them apart from convicts and beggars? Um, but then also if this is what the military is dealing with, what is it like for everyone else? So that's maybe the point is that I think this is is this is illustrating a problem with resource resource availability in early colonial Hobart in a way that maybe you know we can read about it, but this this is kind of a really tangible sense of you know something something's not right you know this, things are tough like people are not having an easy time right now, um, and this is maybe a, a way to to examine it a bit more closely. Oh, that is not this. Um, anyways, so. That's that's about as far as I've got with the current research. So I think, you know, if anything, we're getting an idea of things. There's a lot more to be done um, and a lot more work to say, you know, how, where these objects originated, like where exactly they came from, the types of garments they represent, um, how they ended up, you know, beneath this barracks building. Um, and so I'm not sure how I'm going for time. Oh my God, I have heaps of time. I'll do a really quick snapshot of future directions. Um, there are some really cool links between um, bone buttons, which these beautiful pieces represent. So these are called bone button blanks or button disc blanks. Um, you find them in basically every British colonial site 
it, you know, from the 19th, sort of 18th through 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and effectively, they it was a way for um, usually people incarcerated um, to to do work. Like it was it was work given usually to people like stuck on prison hulks, people in other military establishments, um, sometimes you know people in prisons and things like that. You find them across everywhere. And there's been some really amazing research done that actually connects this kind of entire sort of British colonial enterprise, in that the size so. In order to get a good enough piece of bone that you then cut out a circle that then is either covered in fabric and made into a button or that further defined and has holes drilled into it to make a button and polished, you need a certain part of a bone, usually like the kind of the rib of a cow um, or in some places the carapace of a turtle. That was more in the, the um, Caribbean uh, areas. But um, what they found is the perfect size of of the, le the perfect length that they're finding for all of these button blanks is about the exact about the exact length of 15 pounds of beef rib, which is the amount that they would actually pack as salt beef rations. So they would be, you know, for the most part, these salt beef rations were coming from Northeast North America, so Canada or the States and later Canada. They butcher them, they'd, they'd salt them so that they could be preserved and they'd last, you know, transport across the entire empire. And all across the empire, people are then using these to make buttons. And there's this really fascinating story about food and clothing, you know, across an entire empire. Um, so I thought that was a really cool note. So I just threw that in there for fun. So I'm hoping to look at that and actually see if we can figure out. Um, you can do like isotopic analysis to figure out exactly where the beef. Yes. Oh, they're bone. Yeah. So they're they're basically like pieces of ribs that they've sliced in half, and then they use kind of like um, a type of like compass and they, they spin it basically and it, they, yeah it cuts out discs um which is yeah which is pretty amazing um and they're yeah they're they're everywhere like every you can't hit a colonial site in um the former british colonies without finding some of these so um other interesting things are evidence of like partially worked and unworked kangaroo skin so in 1822 um Hobart prisoners and ticket of leave men were officially forbidden from wearing items made of skin. So they were finding that the convicts that had a bit of money um, were just buying clothing made out of kangaroo skin. And so they were usually better dressed than the officials. Um, so they, they put an end to that. But we found some bits and pieces of um, partially processed kangaroo skin underneath the barracks. Um, the next thing I'm looking at is a game called Why Is There a Pocket? Um, so, you know, this is looking less on the convict side of thing, but we're, I'm finding, you know, evidence of mending and patching in really odd places, like this patch here, you can see it's quite a long, narrow patch. Um, it's not actually in an area that's been damaged. Like there's a great big tear here, but there's been no damage there. And I'm finding a lot of that. So I'm not sure if there's something tied to like concealment or, you know, hiding of personal effects or, or stashing or things like that. Um, and the last thing was, what are they doing with the rags? These are all the very fancy names for all the papers. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the textile pieces that we're finding, they're actually cut into very consistent square sizes. They're all about this big. Um, and there's an example of a few of them there. Now, one of the majors at Anglesey has suggested that they're using them to clean their rifles. So, you know, when all else is done and you've done whatever you can to save this bit of clothing, you've tried to make another piece of clothing, you know, use it to clean your guns. So we've got some lovely examples here. I'm pretty sure that's, you know, some good example of gun cleaning. It seems to be pretty consistent. But the question is, there's a hospital up the hill. Are they also using it as rags for like bandaging wounds and things like that? So um, yeah, the next one, if anyone knows, if anyone has a really good idea why you have a piece of cloth about this big and what you'd use it for, please tell me because um, yeah, so far cleaning guns and packing wounds seem to be the two, the two areas that I've gone into, um, as well as possibly patching clothing, yes. Rags or something that used to be made. Oh, really? Is that the ones where they like they tie the rags together? Well, I'm not sure exactly how you do it, but I imagine you would have a yeah not about that long, and it's just sort of sewn through, oh, and, it, yeah. and it makes a mat, and you've got nothing else to make it from. Of course. Maybe, maybe they tie them. I'm not sure. That's amazing. Some other might have had one. Okay, that is, thank you so much. Those those are the types of things we can kind of like try to piece together what they're doing with them. So thank you so much for that. I'll add rag mats to the, um, why are they making rags list? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and that's that's pretty much it for me. So I'd like to thank Dr. Kate Hibbert, Department of Defense, uh, Major Chris Talbot and Major Brett Reeves, Army Museum of Tasmania, uh, Ricky Tilliard from Ventia, and then all the very talented staff and volunteers at the Army Museum of Tasmania. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. 
Okay, amazing. Okay. Yep, yeah. that's cool. Thing. I was, yeah, okay, thank you so much. Okay, brilliant. I'm gonna, I'll grab my notebook in a sec. So red max patchwork. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Like, um, thank you, thank you so much for that. Oh, yeah. Well, Will some of the actual items be viewable one day? So from my understanding, I think you can ask at the Army Museum of Tasmania to have a look at some of the objects, but Chris will know better than me. There's some on display now. Oh, are there? Oh, amazing. There's some are on display. Um, and if you do, the, the collection is is there at the moment. So you should, yeah, you should ask. It's, I think other people, I know other people have um, asked to view some of the collections. So yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, so what's the best thing you've been? <laughs> on this on this site? Oh my gosh. That is that is so tough. Um if for for anywhere, I did find um part of a demon sculpture in a in Jamaica, um, in a Spanish sculptor's workshop from the, the Renaissance period. That was pretty crazy. That that rates up there is like, oh my goodness. Another one was actually in W. We found a spear actually hidden in a, a stone niche, which was so so amazing it became a registered site so it didn't get blown up but um yeah well <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah lots of cool things but i think i think from this side i think um that caller like what like what a story it's so amazing to actually i think connect a person you know to an object and actually say something about their lives in a way that i think i think we can relate to but is also very sad i don't know i always i mean it, it might just be me but sometimes i feel like we read so much about people in the past you know, that we forget that there are people with, you know, very common foibles and, you know, things that have happened. And I just, at least, at least I do, as soon as they kind of come down to being statistics, you know, this many people moved, migrated this year, this many people did this, like that kind of very, very personal touches. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah. If you talk about getting them forensically tested. Yeah. But can, do you sort of attempt to clean them in any way to improve? What you can tell about them, or you have to in the original stone. So there are a couple of conservators that work with the Army Museum of Tasmania. So if anything's looked in rough shape, we have cleaned it up. And a couple of the items, you know, we've used like really lightly brushed just to get a better look at them. Um, but most things from what the conservators have said, like they've they've been the space under that building was so stable. Um, and they're now in a climate controlled room that basically like if we don't need to touch them, they're just, you know, kind of in either Tyvek sleeves or in bags and they'll they'll stay there until somebody has a really good question to then play with them a bit more. Yeah. No, thank you. Did you find any uh, crockery or? We did. Yes, we found some other bits and pieces. So there was some um, bits of transfer printed earthenware. Um, which is pretty, you know, pretty common on early colonial sites. We also found, you know, bits and pieces like gun flints, um, pardon me, traces of the wallpaper from the building above. So it's actually, it's an interesting assemblage. So we've got all these artifacts that we think have to do this earlier phase and, you know, some are on the surface, but you also get the bits and pieces that have actually fallen through the floorboards of the barracks as it's been in operations. So, you know, when you have a big, like giant chunk of cloth, you're like, well, that's not going to fall through, you know, a gap in the floorboard. But, you know, we can get like little coins and buttons and, and you know, we'd um, brush, you know, hair brushes and, and things and combs and things like that. Um, some of it does. And so that's where we've got, oh, sorry. Last one. Um, a couple of bottle bases, nothing, nothing too extensive, um, but I think the mix of other artifact types. So the the grand running theory that we're hoping to test one day soon, because we're going to put a test pit into this building. Um, so what you couldn't see from the photo is that there's actually a heap of brick rubble, but it's it's different brick than the current um, second soldier barracks. And so what I'm wondering if there wasn't like a really early kind of ephemeral timber building with like a brick chimney. Right. And then they had a, they kind of use it as a bit of a quartermaster store or like a workshop for the cobbler and tailor. Um, and then that's been basically just knocked over and they've built the barracks around it because although the site is, you know, it's quite high and it's um, on the top of this hill, there isn't really a lot of amazing usable space. Like that was the best spot directly across from the first soldier barracks and right next, next to the parade ground. So if there was something maybe earlier and more ephemeral, um, you, you know, like, it, it might have just gone. And so I'm, I'm really curious to know if there is like a whole other archaeological site actually underneath that building. Um, and that's that's my running theory, because, yeah, there are a lot of other artifact types. So the clothing and the textiles, 
by far outnumber everything else. Um, but we're getting bits of like butchered animal bone, like like big pieces that again won't fall into the floorboards. We're getting you know animal bone, bottle bases, bits of ceramics. Um, so I think there is more of a site under there, um, which is very exciting. But also it's really awful going under there. But it's very cool. So there's a lot of um a weighing up an opportunity of a yeah um, um pros and cons. So yeah. Anyone else? Is there still a lot that is being um, researched, and and is that on, is that like years worth, or uh, is it? It is. It is years worth. It is. It is. Um, so effectively, when we looked at the job, so the first time I went into that space, I had you know one flashlight, and I like had a look around, and I'm like, yeah, 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 probably a couple hundred artifacts. But when you when you go back in in and amongst the rubble, and you've got like 10, 10 lanterns and um, really high, you know, we, so we got a lot, a lot more artifacts out than anybody would have anticipated, I think, um, especially just on the surface, like it was um, quite a high density. Um, a lot of it is there, we are looking at, like, I would like to talk to a university or somebody to see if they maybe have some students who can help analyze the collection in more detail. Um, because like I'm, I'm working on it as a volunteer, um, but I have only so much free time and there's so many things to look at. Also, if anyone wants to volunteer, it's a cool collection. You should uh, talk, <laughs> talk to the army museum because yeah, it's, um, it really, it really is something else. And, you know, we're lucky it is in good condition that you can handle it. It's not just crumbling away. Like it's actually quite robust. Um, yeah. Uh, it's rather contentious. Um, given this is to do with the barracks, mm. what is happening with Willow Court in Norfolk? Because that was the region of the barracks. Mm. I mean, yeah. And there is so much. I have a lot to do originally when it was sold. Yeah. And there was so much there that mm. they could do with archaeological. But I know yeah. it's been a bit, but I mean, it's just been. Ignored. Yeah. There's no funding. I don't know. Yeah. But it's just it's about to be sold again. Yeah. Right. And okay. There is so much down there underneath, and that was like what was that? 1822, 18. Absolutely. I mean, they had all the soldiers came up from. Well, it's, yeah. It's like, yeah. And from like and yeah. It just seems to just yeah. Between the cracks. Yeah. Oops, excuse me. No, 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 please. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing fun. Yeah. And it is, you know, and I've yeah. gone through all those buildings because I worked for the original person who bought it. Yeah. And what was there and what's yeah. going on at the moment, they're trying to get through the council, mm. um, trying to gather together all the historical artifacts that yeah. found. But they yeah. it spread everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Being lost. Some yeah. real estate agents, some private hands. Gee. But I can't understand why. Yeah. Yeah. That it's just being ignored. It is as if yeah. it's caught up. Absolutely. Um, and it's just sitting there rotting. I have a lot of thoughts. Not many I would have put <laughs> on a webinar. Um, but look, I think hopefully as, you know, as works progress there, like, I don't know, like, I'm not sure who's assessing these things. Like, I'm on Heritage Council, so if things do come through there, I, I have a look at the archaeology, and I'm sure you can tell, I'm very fond of underfloor deposits, so, you know, I've, I have a very keen eye on that for any documentation that comes through to make sure it's considered. Um, but I, I'm i not sure, like, I don't I don't know much about what's planned there. I don't know what's come before, it's like, really yeah. 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 Um, yesterday about mm. things because mm. we actually we live in a house that the colonial surgeon built, which was built at the same time as. Oh like, wow! What? Yeah, amazing. Dr. James Scott. Yeah. So we're in that place, and so it's built by the same. People. Yeah. Yeah. So we've always had an interest in it, and yeah. I'm on the side of the Royal Dewitt Hospital. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying. I was there from like 2001 yeah. to see what happened. Yeah. And yeah. To, and even when we had the meeting yesterday, mm. Craig couldn't get to the bottom. He said he's trying to get to the bottom yeah. of it. And it's just, there's a, a wall set up and there's so much stuff that's gone missing. Yeah. But it's all being sold off separately yeah. now. And now's the time yeah. before they redo everything to get down under there. Actually, comprehensively look at it. Oh. You know, it's absolutely. I think, look, I think of the many issues that you might find 
you know, I think one problem is that heritage usually costs money and not a lot of people value it. You know, and that's, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, everyone here does like amazing, like you guys are here and, you know, then that's, that's brilliant. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people, you, and like you, you try to explain to people day to day, you know, why things like this are important to understand the past, you know, so many things that we repeat going to the future. You know, if you, people read more history books, it wouldn't be maybe quite as scary. Um, but I don't know, like, you know, how do we, how do we make people value heritage and maybe want to do something? And like institutional sites do, they are so tricky. Like I worked um, at a similar site in Canada where I'm from. So I, I worked with them for a few years on and off as a volunteer. And like, especially, especially places like asylums, like they're difficult places in that their their history is interesting, their heritage is interesting, you know, but for other people, you know, they want to brush it under the mat. They don't want to know it's painful. They don't want their ancestors implicated. Like there's, there's so many difficulties with places like that. Like it's, oh man, it's, yeah, I'm like, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy hill to try to, you know, push something up because yeah, far out, there's, there's so many variables at work. Um, and yeah, I think the biggest one though, unfortunately, is getting people to value heritage. Like it's important, you know, we learn from it. It, it makes our places more interesting and, and unique, you know, but um, not, you know, I feel like, you know, we're, most of us might be on that page, but you need to get the council on that page. A lot of councils are really afraid to have any risk, it's a generation. anything. Yeah. I mean, I was at yeah. New Norfolk when I was doing the research on There were 1,600 people employed. Yeah. There. Yeah. So half the town either worked there or were in. Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. But the no. thing is that, you know, 2023 and nothing's yeah. been solved. Yeah. And I know that two sisters have just bought the children's hospital. Yeah. And they're redoing that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether they've got, I don't know. That they've got something involved going underneath the floorboards. Mm. I don't know. Mm, yeah, but, absolutely. You know. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's very tricky. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's yeah, it's it's so tricky. Like no, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I I don't know myself, but um, yeah, it's, it's something to be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does does anybody else have any questions or? Well, um, let everyone run free. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go out. Oh, okay. Okay. No, no, no. No stress. It's... Well, I remember a few years ago, um, somebody talking about, now, I'm not sure if it was the old prison or actually Ingles and Barracks. Oh, okay. Um, they were talking about people putting what they thought were possibly some sort of talisman. <gasps> yes. The, yeah, you know that this the magical inscriptions. Yes, there's. I think Woolmers as well has some. Oh, maybe some at Sheen. It was, yeah. It was either the barracks or yeah. the old prison. Yeah. Uh, putting the children's shoes and. Oh um, yes. Yep. Yeah. Was, was that was Brickenden. 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 No. And the book I heard about Tippy Wallace. Maybe as well. Um. And then up at Sheen, I think in the in the in the windows or the yeah. stone they little things. Um, I do, I do know from other sites I've excavated that like definitely there is um at work often like forms of like local folklore but like yeah they'll bury I think a cat a cat is a common like cats in the walls or under the floors shoes um sometimes horseshoes like tokens for playing I don't know drafts or something yeah. I don't know if it's, I don't even know if it's the same place as well. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of these are old yeah. too, but have you come across anything like that or maybe it's the wrong sort of building? I have. I've come across it in other buildings. This one, it's tricky because like most of those buildings, you actually have like kind of the joists and bears and you have a very clear spatial association with, they built that house, here is the dead cat they put under that wall like that, you know, the association is a little bit clearer. With this one, there's like a half a meter fall, and there's the demolition rubble from possibly another building. And so the, the spatial understanding is a little bit more vague. Um, so it's hard to say, like, and we didn't really find, we did find one animal skull, um, but it's hard, like, it's not really, it's not in a wall, it's not in a, in a like, in part of the floor substructure. Like, so it's, it's, it's harder to kind of make those connections, but I do know what you mean. And far, it's a fascinating topic. Um, so I'm always, I've always got my eyes open for things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Is that no?
Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Your phone. This is a token. Oh, my goodness. To you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the talking. Thank you. 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 Thank you.